And welcome to episode three of Devil Dash here on Dash Sports TV. Uh, this week we're going to be doing something a little bit different as, uh, you know, there's no football coming up for ASU. But so we're going to take a look into the past, the present, and potentially the future of what could have been for ASU football. So to kick it off, we're going to be looking at the past and, you know, one of ASU's best players, probably their best player, is Jaden Daniels. Um, he has a chance to go very high in the draft to leave college a year early. Um, so that brought us to the question of who do you think is the best quarterback in ASU history? Yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, you know, every team historically has quarterbacks that have done good and set records. You know, early on you're going to set record books, but it's kind of tough. You know, you can't – how do you compare some of these new age guys – including all the new age stats that we have compared to some guy who's back in 1950. I know it's tough, but I mean, off the top of my head, the first one of the best quarterbacks that's come through the ASU program is Jake the Snake. Jake Plummer was third, finished third in Heisman voting in 1996. I mean, you know, there's been some pretty good ASU quarterbacks, but that is pretty tough to beat. So yeah, the, he the Heisman, that's definitely, you know, something that no one else on the ASU has, but a name that I think a lot of people forget that personally as a fan has been my favorite of all time was Taylor Kelly. I mean, I grew up with season tickets to this guy. He took us to a Pac-12 championship, which we ended up getting murdered by Stanford, but we got to host one, which was, you know, kind of throwing ASU's hat back into the ring of, you know, we can be good again. Um, but I got some stats for you. In 2013, um, the year we made it to the Pac-12 championship, uh, Kelly threw four, 3,600 yards, 28 touchdowns, ran for another 600 yards, and had another nine rushing touchdowns. And then the following the year in 2014, he ended up getting injured at the end of the year, but that was the year he had ASU all the way up to the number seven seed in the country. That was the first year of the college football playoff rankings. And then we ended up losing to Oregon State, uh, I believe in the third to last game of the season, one of those you know wacky Pac-12 games that ends at you know midnight or 12.30. And then we ended up playing U of A in a winner-take-all Pac-12 South game down in Tucson, where it was one of the best territorial cups ever, besides the 19-point comeback, of course. But one of the best territorial cups ever that uh, Berkovici ended up playing because Taylor Kelly was hurt that Arizona State ended up eventually losing. But it was one of the best seven games of ASU history, I want to say, besides, you know, they had their undefeated year back in the past. But of, you know, recent history, and it means a lot to a program when – you know, you've had a lot of bad years in a row. And when you have that year of, you know, getting up to number seven, even if you do lose two of your last three, it's that national recognition where ESPN wants to cover your games again. And, right. You know, what do you think of Jaden Daniels? Though? Do you think he has a shot to go down as one of the best? You know, obviously he's had one year and his stats are going to be deflated because of COVID. He's only going to play two instead of three. But, you know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variables. I mean, COVID and sitting out a season now. Um, I don't know. I mean, he only has one year under his belt. You got to remember that. And then look at when you're, when you're comparing these quarterbacks, look at other quarterbacks in like the Pac-12, for instance, like Keaton Slovis is a true freshman last year as well. He put up, I'm guessing, I'm pretty sure he put up over like 600, 700 more yards than Jaden Daniels, a handful more touchdowns. And you got to look compared to that and just like, I don't know. I mean, Jaden Daniels could possibly be maybe a top 16, top 20 draft pick, but I don't know if he could touch Jake the Snake. So something that's interesting, I think, about Jaden Daniels is he's going to be, you know, whether it's Slovis, Howe, maybe tossing one or two more names, uh, not this draft, but next draft, he's going to be one of those top three to five quarterbacks taken. But the, the thing is, if you look at his stats, he's not really a pop-off-the-page you know, 350 yards a game type guy. And something I, I wanted to bring up an interesting fact that I saw earlier today that Arizona State last year was three and five against the spread. And for, for what for those at home who don't know what that means, against the spread is if ASU is playing Kent State at the beginning of the year, Arizona State's the favorite in that game. So they would probably be given, you know, be favored to win by two touchdowns. And if they're favored to win by 14 points, at the end of the game, you subtract 14 from their score. And if they hit that, if they let's say they win by 15, they they win against the spread. If they're under 14, you know, let's say they lose the game, they they lose against the spread. And ASU was three and five against the spread. And I think although we were above 500 football team last year, 
it's it shows to kind of the type of coach Herm Edwards is is he's never really going for the throat. He's I'm up ten points in the third quarter on the road, and I'm going to run the ball three times. Hopefully, I get a first down. So if I do, I'm going to run the ball three more times, and he's going to burn that clock. We've seen that against you know the Michigan States. We beat them back to back years off clock management. Um, you know we've seen that so many times, and we've seen it hurt us a few times too. But it's kind of the trust the Herm process, and I think. That's why Jane Daniels numbers won't necessarily pop off the page, but I think that's why he's going to get recognized as being a no, a top 15 draft pick. And so we looked it up. The top draft pick from ASU ever was Terrell Suggs at number 10. Where do you think Jane Daniels, do you think at the end of his career, he could be above number 10 or do you think, you know, his ceiling is around that 15 to 20 limit? I think honestly his ceiling is like the top 20 limit. I mean, until he really does something game changing, league changing in back 12 um like i would say for starters you know throw over throw 3500 yards 20 27 touchdowns and go first in the back 12 i mean that's something that's you know progress that we can see over the course of two or three years you know that's something we can judge better judge draft pick off of. yeah and the thing that was kind of kind of worrisome about Jaden Daniels is that at the beginning of the year, you know, he was making a lot of uh, dump downs, but wasn't turning the ball over. And, you know, it was his first few games ever as a quarterback and he had to grow. But at the end of the year, he kind of started building it, putting it together. And you got, you really had that hope for this season, which, you know, obviously isn't happening, but then came around Florida state. This Florida state team was banged up. Their coach was getting fired. It was a whole lot of things that, you know, they, they didn't really want to be in that game. I want to say they turn. We turned the ball. They turned the ball over to us six times, and I think our offense. I can't remember how many points we scored, but it was somewhere around the thirteen to twenty-one point range. And Jane Daniels and the offense just looked like they couldn't do anything out there. And it was the defense scoring points, putting the offense in field goal position, stuff like that. And so I, that's why this season was really interesting to see. You know, Jane Daniels wasn't just a great player on the team helping ASU. But with Eno Benjamin and, you know, Nikhil Harry Brandon, I, you've got all these great players gone. Was it time for Jaden Daniels to become the man? You know, the reason that ASU is winning these football games, you know, he's throwing for 350, maybe averaging 75 yards running, you know, just sprinkling in something different every game. You know, that's what he did to win games. But it was also a mixture of, you know, great plays by Eno Benjamin or a, a timely turnover. So, I think it's going to be. Plays too. I think if anything, it's going to hurt his draft stock missing a year because he definitely needed to gain weight, and I think that's something he could have shown this year. You know, a big one, first year to second year jump. Um, but it it will be interesting to see. You know, his name has been thrown out for the transfer portal. Like he could potentially play again this season, which would help his stock. But you know, we've seen the trust in Herm and the the players they're putting around him. So I think he believes that this is a great opportunity for him. My hot take. For this section of the uh, episode three is that Jaden Daniels will set the record for being the highest drafted quarterback out of Arizona State. Yeah, it's not a it's not a bad. You have to say what is the highest before? It was Mark Malone, and he got drafted twenty eighth overall in the first round by the Pittsburgh it's, Steelers. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think he's going to go higher than that. I mean, like twenty eight. Yeah, he's going to be a, he's going to be on a team. I think he's going to be. You know how much of a rush there is on quarterbacks every year. And I think he's going to be in that first tier of bad teams. You know, there's always the Dolphins, the Browns, you know, the Bills that always seem to be looking for a quarterback every five years, three years. And um, I think he's going to be in that first patch of quarterbacks that goes. And then there's going to be that second patch, you know, that's usually at the end of the first round. But I really see him going top, you know, 10 to 15, really, I, I really do, because of the weapons he's going to have around him in the future at ASU. But we, we did mention the transfer uh, the transfer portal. We saw a big name today out of U of A, Colin Schooler, um, transfer from University University of Arizona, or sorry, U Arizona, um, transfer to Texas Tech. And, hey, man, I, I don't blame trans- all the players transferring because their team is so bad, they had to rebrand their name just so, you know, they couldn't, stay along with U of A, but um, that really is a big loss for the Wildcats. Um, we now see three of their top four tacklers from last year in Colin Schooler, Tony Fields, and Scotty Young Jr. Um, transfer, um, three of their four top tacklers. So, you know, what does this mean for ASU? Do you think uh, you, you think we could see some players fall in their footsteps? I mean, I 
Personally, I don't think I think there's a different culture established at um, Arizona State with you know the uniformity between from Ray Anderson and uh, Herm Edwards compared to Kevin Sumlin and their their commissioner over there. I mean, we're just a different program right now. We didn't we weren't at the high that they were at and then fell to the low that they went after uh, you know after Tate kind of just came crashing back down to earth after that insane season. Um, but I mean, for the spring, um, season that is scheduled right now, we play the U Arizona first game and that would be a wild first territorial cup start off the season for the Sun Devils. And I mean, I'm pretty sure we'd come away with a victory there, but what a rush to start the season and just motivate our guys. I think it would be, I mean, it's purely beneficial for the Sun Devils. So I think that schedule you're talking about might have been the one um, that that was supposed to be for the fall schedule if there were to be a season, the Pac-12 only. I don't think they've released a spring schedule as of yet, but I think the reason they did that was because they were, the Pac-12 was like, hey, this is our Pac-12 only schedule. And they looked at it and said, let's put all the, a lot of these rivalries first because odds are we're not going to finish the season. So, you know, give those fans these games like the Arizona Arizona State, the, you know, the Oregon, the Oregon State, the USC, UCLA, some of those games that have the history, you know, the Stanford Cows, um, and the, the ones that the fans really want to see. So, you know, you don't want to see the ASU Colorado games in week one, and then by, if the season does get shut down, you lose ASU Oregon, ASU USC, and ASU U of A. Those are the games, you know, you really want to see. Um, so I think they try to put as scheduling wise as many as in there possible. But go back to the culture that you talked about. Uh, look at let's compare Kevin Sumlin and Herm Edwards side by side. These guys were hired at the same time, and Kevin Sumlin was kind of thought of as a you know a home run coach, uh, someone that was going to come in had so much success recruiting at Texas Tech. I mean, sorry, at Texas A and M. Pardon me. Uh, had Johnny Manziel led them to national prowess. Uh, and he comes into Tucson, and brings in. He has Demarco Murray as one of his running backs coach. He kind of just has this a lot of a lot of hype around the train. And then Herm Edwards was uh, Ray Anderson, our athletic director, hadn't interviewed anyone else. Um, you know, it was kind of just kind of a questionable hire. But now it looks like Herm Edwards is the fantastic coach. And you kind of scratching your head after all these players are transferring. Like, where are these wins going to come from U of A? So give me give me your ranking. Rank where you think Kevin Sumlin is is as a coach right now versus the Herm Edwards hire? What, what would you give both hires as right now? Well, I mean, if I had to grade them, I don't know how to rank them. I yeah, mean, grade I, them, sorry. I'll grade them. I mean, I'll give, a, I'll give the Herm hire an 8 out of 10 and the Sullen hire, let's go 6 out of 10. I mean, it's generous, dude. If you think about it, they're pretty similar. Like, look at just thinking about what you said, like bringing DeMarco Murray in, that reminded me. Um, Herm Edwards brought in Marvin Lewis, who, you know, coached in the NFL. Um, did he coach alongside Herm? Um, I do not believe so. I, he might have been a coach for Herm, but I don't know if he ever coached uh, with Herm. He's kind of – yeah, at ASU, he's not just – he's not really a coach. He's more of an advisor for yeah. the program, but yeah. But think about um, U Arizona and ASU, both bringing in new coaches, both bringing in, you know, supervisors. Yeah. Well, I mean, DeMarco Murray, running back coach, a little yeah. different, but um, – you know, same kind of trying to instill the same culture, but man, what Kevin Sumlin did at U Arizona did. I mean, I think, I feel like, um, what's the quarterback's name again? Uh, Grant Cano. No, no, no. The um, Khalil Tate. Yeah, Khalil Tate. I think he was just, you know, running the show kind of yeah. type deal. And Sumlin kind of ch charged in there and was like, yo, I'm going to do this my way, the Texas A&M way. Uh, I got Johnny, Johnny Money Man's that way. Um, but, look, that did not work at all. I mean, Herm came in after Manny left. Um, we got Jaden. I mean, he did – I feel like Herm did a bunch of that recruiting by himself too, which kind of just made it a little more personal maybe. What do you think? I think it really kind of shows to what type of programs the teams were looking to build. I mean – DeMarco Murray had some off the field issues with the, you know, with different teams in the NFL, but you kind of, you kind of bring a player like that in for, you know, the recognition, the name recognition, the players, you know, young kids recognize that name from playing fantasy football and stuff like that. But ASU brought in pros, you know, people that had years yeah. of experience. And I think that shows, you know, 
players don't want to play. Players don't want to play for you know just a big name, Demarco Murray. Who cares about that? Players want to make it to the NFL. And when you put the people there that want to, you know, that want you to play in the NFL, that know how to get you there, that have been there themselves, you know, I think that shows that just kind of the programs where U of A kind of swung and miss. Um, I mean, it, we really don't know where these wins are going to come from from U of A. They're really depleted on defense, and on, to be honest, the defense that wasn't very good last year. I mean, I mean, their defense averaged thirty-five. They gave up thirty-five points a game on average last year. And they just lost, you know, we just talked about it earlier, Schooler and uh, well, Colin Schooler and Troy Fields. The defense that, uh, the, that U Arizona was running was a 4-3, and that's a two inside linebacker defense. Both those guys have been playing that same position since 2017. Yeah. Think about, you know, the, those years, all those tackle, all those practices, all that communication, those guys that – that chemistry they have working together at that spot. It's just gone now. Yeah. No, I, and I just want to read you. I was pulling it up while you are talking. The, uh, the stats for the tackle-wise, Colin Schooler was first on the team with 98. Uh, Tony Fields was ninety second with 94. And then Scotty Young was uh, fourth with 58 – sorry, 66 tackles last year. So, you know, you're losing, like I said earlier in the show, three of your top four tacklers. And – you said, sorry, what was it, 35 points per game? I don't know really how you can recover. Yeah, right? It's a defense that was way below average already and losing for three of their four best players. And I don't know, someone, it's really, it's really going to be interesting to see how much longer he stays on as coach because, you know, there's a lot of hype around Grant Cannell, but this is still not the end of the transfers. I know ASU still could have a few as well. Um, we saw a fifth-year fifth year senior um, – Enter the transfer portal for ASU, but you know, realistically, he was never going to play because of Jaden Daniels. But um, you know, if if ASU were to get a few transfers, I think it would be really interesting to be see to see what their explanation was. We talked about you know some USC players transferring just because they're most likely going to go pro next year, but you really just got to look at it, and it it would be really interesting to see why because. They've been they've been really hammering home that we trust Herm, the players have, and then Herm's been hammering home we really trust the players and we give back our attention to the players. So, I mean, Herm Herm really hasn't figured out with the with the kids and you know getting in touch with them, but also giving them their distance. And hopefully, we don't see any more transfers because I think even if even though if we have a few losses next year, I think the the following year could be really promising for for the Sun Devil football team and. Like we said, building that Jane Daniels draft stock up. Yeah, and just back to you, Arizona. I mean, Kevin Sumlin is for sure on the hot seat right now. I mean, I think he's on a short leash, like we both said. It's going to be sketchy to see what, what happens, but he's not in. Khalil Tate's not there anymore. It's Grant Gannell. Yeah. Think about this. He's been, whenever the season starts, he's going to have all this time to implement his program, you know, his way to fresh, fresh um, players. So maybe it will be a little bit different. I mean, it's not looking good because of just Absolutely. four transfers. And I mean, you know, there could be more. I mean, if, especially if the Big Ten ends up playing. I mean, that's the thing. Like, what if the Big Ten, you know, next week announces that they're going to play, start playing football in November? And it's very possible. <laughs> I mean, Chad Johnson Jr leaves and then someone else leaves and you know what I mean because the Pac-12 they've already made looks like they've already made their decision and they're not going to play so it's these players are making their own decisions it's and it's I think it's different for the kids that are coming in because they haven't even had that taste of ASU football yet where they would love to be here and but I think that the real question is for these people that are either juniors or seniors and are going to go pro do you do you want to wait that extra year, risk maybe injury to you know in this year, and then go pro, or do you want to transfer, play play your last year, and then just take your money, take your money when you can get it, and you can't really you can't really blame anyone either way. You know whatever they decide, it makes sense. You know if you want to stick to your school, if you want to go make money immediately, I mean you know it's really hard to say no when there's a few million dollars getting put in front of your face. So, but you know we talked about you Arizona and how this potential schedule would be um, 
the it would be a fun schedule with Arizona first, USC kind of tucked in at the back where it could be you know a winner take all game for Pac-12 South. Uh, so we wanted to go up to the potential of what ASU could go. So first off, give me there's there would have been a ten game schedule. What record do you think ASU would have gone? So I think ASU would have finished seven and three looking at the proposed all Pac-12 schedule. So we're go, we'll go through game by game, and I personally think. Eight and two would have been our would have been our record. We'll go through and explain each one why. But um, wanted to point out that it was interesting. ASU doesn't get a lot of national love um, all the time. But there was an article from 27, uh, 24-7 Sports that had ASU finishing first, uh, USC second, and Utah third. Which you know it's pretty it's pretty nice to finally to finally get that love from the national. I know they're not the most reliable. They're not the not the be all end all. But um, you know, just talking, seeing an article about the, you know, the culture at ASU for once, instead of Arizona sports being an absolute dumpster fire, it's pretty, pretty refreshing to see. So um, we're going to go through game by game. Game one, you Arizona. Give me a score. Give me, you know, record at the time for ASU. Um, I say we finish the game 1-0. I mean, I say I, 1-0, yeah. and then we're going to win by 20 Points. Yeah, I, I had that one as a 49-17 game. Um, I don't think that game would have ever been close. Even if it's at U of A, U of Arizona, apologies. Uh, there's no fans there. It's not going to make a difference. Uh, U of Arizona gets um, washed aside. So <laughs> next we have um, Stanford. Uh, that would have been a home game. Um, you know, ASU doesn't play Stanford well a whole lot. What do you, what do you have for this one? Um, I think we would have beat Stanford as well. I mean, by at least two touchdowns. I think this one's interesting. So you have uh, Arizona State going two and zero. I think ASU would have pulled this one out pretty pretty narrowly. But I, I had a twenty three twenty game. ASU moves on to two and zero. I think the defense is going to take would have taken another step up along with this offense. I think this offense would have been a lot to handle. Where even if you do play a solid defensive game, you're not going to really hold them down all game. Uh, third game of the season would have been at Oregon. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is uh, this will be a change of change of scenery for the Devils. I mean, I just feel like that Mario Cristobal defense would, after four quarters of football, would clamp down on Jaden Daniels, and they would just suffocate us. They'd make adjustments in the you know late in the game. I feel like it'd be close. I feel like that Jaden, you know, Herm's game plan could keep us in it. But at the end of the day, the Ducks, you know, they're going to have that salty taste of uh, that big L they took in 10 last year. And uh, they're going to want to avenge that. And playing in the Autzen is, is going to be tough. So this might be a little bit of a, you know, a hot take here. But I have ASU winning this game. I have it being, wow. I have, I had it being an absolute wow. shootout. So listen, this, let me explain why. I had a 49-42 game ASU winning. I think the ASU does this every single year. They win a few games, high-profile games in the beginning, and they get the, the huge national hype. We've seen it with Michigan State two years in a row. We've seen it with you know other big names. And I think this is when people would say, wow, Jane Daniels had a great first year. He's on the rise second year. Two big wins over Oregon and Stanford. I think that would have been a primetime Saturday night game. I think ASU wins that, and then they're usually in for a huge letdown game. So I have ASU at 3 now, Josh at 2-1. and one. We go to our next game, ASU versus UCLA. What do you think? Yeah, um, pretty sure we play away at that one. Uh, no, that one's home, okay, actually. White Would have been. On this but, one. Um, yeah, I think we can beat UCLA at home. I think um, they'll put up a lot harder fight than some people think. I mean, UCLA, I think UCLA is a little better than Cal, and that'll be a tough game, too, but... So uh, I have ASU winning this one, but very narrowly. Um, it's ASU always seems to struggle with quarterbacks that can run. DTR is a very athletic quarterback. We saw a really struggling, really badly struggling uh, UCLA team torch ASU. It wasn't even close in the Rose Bowl last year. Um, I have this game as uh, 42 to 38. Um, pretty close game, but again, ASU always seems to struggle with those uh, scrambling quarterbacks. So I have ASU moving to four and one or four and zero. You have three and one. Moving on to the fifth game, Colorado. I have Colorado. ASU always seems to struggle with Colorado. What do you think here? Yeah, I was about to say. I mean, usually, you know, like last year and probably the year before, these are the, this is the game that 
ASU loses, coming off a big, big win. Um, you know, say it'd be scheduled after the Oregon game. This is a this is a game where we walk in there with our heads high, and we just ignore the fact that Colorado can play. But I think this year it's different, and we win. So I have this as a win as well because um, they they lost you know, the devil eater in LaVisca Chenault. And he always seemed to put up, you know, 120 yards for at least two touchdowns against us. And, um, you know, they lost, uh, Mont- I forgot his name, maybe Steven, sorry, his first name, but Montez, who seems to have been at, been at Colorado for about seven years now, but he's finally gone. Um, ASU, I think, wins this game. I don't think Colorado's going to be all that good this year. I think they can be competitive, but um, I don't think they're going to go 500, maybe Probably not going to make a bowl game this year. But uh, so again, I have ASU winning that one pretty handily, probably by 17, you know, 24 points. But uh, so I actually have them at five and zero. This is where this is where I had ASU really high up. I think if you can get that big big first three wins, you got the Territorial Cup win, you get that momentum going into Stanford, get Stanford, and then you have that big prime time game against Oregon. Your schedule gets pretty a lot easier after that. You know, got UCLA and Colorado, setting yourself up for a potential five and zero ranking. And, you know, pretty high national ranking. And then a big game against Utah. ASU, Utah. Utah's kind of had their number the past few years. But game six, what do you think? Yeah, this is going to be tough. Um, you know, it'll be right in the heat of the Pac-12 South race. Um, but just purely basing my evidence off of what, how ASU played against Utah last year, I do not see ASU winning this game. I see them going to 4-2 and two on the season. So we have two questions. Uh, Jason Marks said, what are your trap games? Colorado maybe. Uh, Jason, to be honest, I know you know a lot more about Colorado than we do, but we've seen big games from, you know, Steven Montez, from LaVisca Chenault, and, you know, others against us. And with those gone, I think ASU is really going to hopefully, in my mind, take that next step of, Hopefully not losing those, you know, smaller games, but not smaller, but, you know, games they should win. Uh, the trap game, though, I really thought would be uh, Cal. We're, we're going to get to that later in, but I think Cal is going to be a really solid team. They showed flashes last year until their quarterback got hurt, but uh, we're going to go through this a little bit quicker just for time. Uh, someone said, you dorks know that spring football isn't happening. Um, yes, we do know, us dorks do know spring football isn't happening. We're just doing a hypothetical of, you know, what ASU – what we thought ASU would have been, you know, just to kind of get our minds racing and thinking about the team a little bit. Um, so going back to it, I think ASU actually loses to Utah as well. Or sorry, not uh, – sorry, we're on Utah, correct? Yeah, sorry, loses to Utah. Um, Utah's always seemed to have our number. They, even though they lost Zach Moss and uh, they lost their quarterback as well, it's, it's never seemed to be the offense that's beaten us. Uh, la- last year their defense just smothered us. It seemed to be they were in the backfield before the ball even got to Jane Daniels' hands and shotgun. Every play. Um, every play. I mean, I- I'm not, I don't think ASU's over that Utah hump yet. So I think they lose their national ranking here. Uh, oh, I-, I believe we uh, – yeah, so they would be 5-1 and one here at this point, and you have them at 4-2. Four and two. Four and two. So moving on to uh, Washington State. Washington State's actually – Played ASU tough, but we saw Jane Daniels kind of coming out party last year against uh, Washington State. What do you think about that game? Yeah, I think he uh, has a little deja vu. I think they win there. I think they do five win. Three, I think they do win uh, pretty easily there as well. So I have them moving to six and one. And then the biggest game of the season would have been at USC. Um, Keaton versus Jaden probably would have been a, the Pac-12 game of the year. But uh, what do you think here? I think Keaton takes the cake here, shows Jaden how it's done. I think USC probably has the better team this year as well. I really think this is a close game. I think this is a shootout. We saw a great game in Tempe last year, but um, I think USC takes this. And it depends how USC does, but I think this would give them the tie, the head-to-head tiebreaker. Um, I think USC would actually finish 8-2 and as well and win the Pac-12 South. Um, so, like I said, trap game Cal. I think ASU wins, but... Cal played a really good game uh, at Cal against ASU last year. Um, I think that's definitely a trap game to look out for if you're ASU. And then um, Oregon State, I think that's another win. What do you think about those last two? Yeah, I think I think we come out of both those. Scary win in Cal, but easy win in Oregon State. So 8-2 and two from jo- for me, 7-3 and three from Josh. Um, we're really hoping we can maybe get some Thanksgiving football, but, um, you know, we're going to have to wait and see. But that is all we have for this week. We want to thank you for watching us here on Devil Dash. It's a pleasure, as always, 
Make sure to follow us on all socials at Dash Sports TV, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, MySpace, you know, LinkedIn, whatever. You know, we're on there. Subscribe. We're on there. Subscribe. Subscribe. To us. Um, our website is dashsports.tv. Uh, if you're interested in any other Pac-12 com- content, make sure to go check our colleagues out. For Josh, I'm Wills, and we will see you next week. Thanks for coming.